I'm Kevin Carlson, and I'm here with George Conger. Yeah, we know our names, and this is the Anglican Report. We're recording from Long Beach, California, where we're kind of finishing up with the Anglican Church uh, in America's uh, uh, kind of annual provincial assembly. Yes, their annual assembly. Okay. This or council meeting. Council meeting. Uh, this is their third annual council meeting uh, for a, a province that's existed for two years. Mm -hmm. they're, they're busy people. Um, and we wanted to give you some news about what's happened this week. They've uh, um, come out with some amazing statistics um, from the, the call two years ago to plant a thousand churches in five years. Um, we have not planted a thousand churches, but um, from any layperson's uh, viewpoint, the statistics are amazing. Yes, they've, they've planted 130 churches. Yeah. Um, some of them are very small, mom and pop operations. Some of them are thriving. Mm -hmm. uh, some are not going to survive. Some are going to do just wonderfully. Right. But 130 churches in two years is a remarkable, remarkable feat. Sure. Uh, a lot of that success has come from uh, uh, Plano putting together what we call M1000. Yes. Uh, it's a. Uh, you hear that noise outside? Yeah. Motorcycles are attracted to cameras. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, you know, they don't know where they are, but they're, they're going to go racing around neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, Anglica 1000 is a, a group put together by David Roseberry uh, of Plano. And uh, uh, it's just an, amazing to put together something that really helps people plant churches. Yes, it's, it's an uh, initiative. It doesn't act itself plant churches. It's yeah. not a, a mission society per se, but it's a clearinghouse for people who want to put, come together and build and plant new expressions of the Anglican ethos in North America. Mm -hmm. And I think that the Anglican ACNA has grown by 34% yeah. in terms of its average Sunday attendance. It has one statistic but Archbishop Duncan has shared is that last year they baptized approximately 1,600 children, infants, and almost the same number of adults. Right. which is a remarkable figure because usually adult baptisms are, are handfuls it's not, and children is the norm. But here they're bringing people, adults, into faith with Jesus Christ through baptism. I mean, they've begun the faith journey and brought them into faith right. and marking it and sealing it with baptism, yeah. which is a remarkable thing. It's almost, uh, I, I don't want to say it's unheard of, but well, it, it is unheard of in an Anglican. Sure, it's the African model of yes. reaching the people who've never heard Christ before. Yes, you know it, the the old Anglican model is to reach the uh, the child, the, the baby who's not heard Christ before, mm -hmm. <laughs> with water, and uh, we've moved beyond that. And it is um, evidence and fruit that this. Uh, uh, Anglican Church in North America is doing what it intended to do. The naysay you're absolutely right. The naysayers at the start said there's no way a church that uh, reaches from the uh, Diocese of Fort Worth, uh, which does sure. not ordain women to the clergy, is very Anglo-Catholic, very mm -hmm. spiky, mm -hmm. uh, incense, bells yeah. and smells, mm -hmm. all the way to the AMIA and um, almost semi-Pentecostal or extreme uh, conservative evangelical, mm -hmm. how a body like that can hold together. But not only is it held together, it's grown, it's sure. thrived. Yeah. As Archbishop Duncan has said, they are focusing on what holds them together, and that's a shared faith in Jesus Christ. And how that works itself out is the responsibility of the congregation and the local. Sure. And birthing a province is obviously messy. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we only have 39 of them. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. it's not something that's easy to do. And in the past, it's been done in a colonial fashion. Uh, the the Church of England would send out a missionary somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, start a church, start a, uh, a, a province. And here, a province has self declared itself, and by its fruit, fruits proven itself. Yeah, and my big fear when all this started, Kevin and I, we we were in Bedford, Texas, when this started formally. Mm -hmm. And my big fear was there are some tremendous egos in. The ACNA among its leadership. Sure. Uh, guys who just cannot uh, be number two. That's right. And I thought, okay, here's another church organization with 100, in, 100 chiefs and no Indians, all right. generals, no sergeants. Yeah. That's not how it's played out. No. It's played out in a constructive, it's not been perfect. There have been 
uh, personality clashes. Mm -hmm. But I think what I come away with from this meeting is Archbishop Duncan's sense of really being a true leader. In the past, people would people would laud him for taking courageous stands and, and you know, almost a semi-martyr approach. Sure. Bob the Lionhearted, some people mm -hmm. like to call him. That's great, that's wonderful, but sure. that sort of leader isn't always the person who needs to be there to build an organization and who is able uh, to make, in other words, that's someone at the start, but who grows it. Well, Archbishop Duncan, I believe, and what I have seen at this council, has been able to grow himself personally, if that's all right. No, it is true. I mean, we're looking at a man who, for all intents and purposes, was our Moses. Hmm. He took us out of Egypt. Um, tech, and he's transformed himself into a Joshua. Um, it's getting a little biblical. For I me. know. I'm sorry, but you know, uh, he's and he's now in that place where he's been able to transition from a person always at war with an enemy mm -hmm. to a person willing to uh, build a foundational structure uh, that is fruitful. Yeah, and and it, and a lot of it are personal qualities that I think relate to his prayer life and spiritual life. Mm -hmm. He, there are people who wish to, t to wish to give him offense, mm -hmm. and he doesn't take it. No, it doesn't. In fact, even in an interview situation, you, I'll ask him the hard question, he says, you're being ridiculous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, it's um, what we see and what he experiences uh, are often um, different because of his approach and the person he is. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's amazing. Now, there's other news going on in the world besides the, the growth of Acton, which uh, I'll say uh, the Anglican Church in North America is growing twice as fast as tech is declining. Um, you it's know, a fair it's, it's a, probably a fair statistic because um, another uh, church in Arizona closed today uh, in tech. And um, that's happening throughout um, uh, North America here and her 16 other uh, <laughs> locations amongst the world. And she's trying to change uh, the leadership role, presiding bishop in tech. Uh, presiding Bishop Catherine Jeffrey, sure. Right. Is trying to, um, as best I can tell, with this new Title IV. Let's, you want to explain quickly what Title IV is? The disciplinary canons, the canons, regu the canons that regulate the uh, clergy and how they are controlled, if you will, by the, the diocese and the national church. And what's new is that the canons are now in conflict with the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Canons adopted at the last General Convention in a very almost slapdash way with no real discussion, no real argument, no real thought about the consequences have been brought forward that gives presiding bishop the powers of an archbishop even though she's not an archbishop. Correct. She can now, well, as of next month, she can now, in her judgment, remove bishops. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are, and there's almost really no credible check upon her authority. Okay. And let's be fair, she's already been doing that. Well, she's been doing it, but then she gets the, she gets rubber stamped by her <laughs> council of advice and, sure. and things like that. But now there's no need to even to go through mm -hmm. um, some of the motions. Right. So, and early on in the 1800s when all this stuff was put together, they never intended uh, the person in charge of uh, the Episcopal Church to have that type of authority. No, I mean, 1800s, 1900s, 20th yeah. century. Yeah. The General Convention, and I know, Kevin, this is the stuff that you just love. <laughs> yes. The 1898 <gasps> General Convention. Yeah, go on. <laughs> investigated should the, the presiding bishop be an archbishop? Mm -hmm. Should we not have a general convention, but have a general synod? Sure. Now, these, are, these may just be words to people, but what it means is the Episcopal Church has always been a bishop, a diet, a, a church of dioceses, mm -hmm. and the presiding bishop was merely the person who presided over the house of bishops. Sure. In the 20th century, she's been given more inter meant more powers, but still authority rested within the diocese that was delegated to general convention. Right. 1890, the general convention of 1898 wanted to flip that and have almost like a Church of England or a Roman Catholic Church where authority starts at the top and works its way down. Mm -hmm. General Convention rejected that. There's been no change to the structure we've always had. Yet now, we're getting changes in the canons 
that overturned the Constitution, mm -hmm. giving the presiding bishop the power to remove a bishop, when in the past that wasn't necessarily so. Yeah, unheard of. It, yeah. Well, bishops could be removed for disciplinary purposes and things like that, but the new, there's a power grab taking place yeah. under the guise of reforming the instruments of the church. But it's, it's a power grab that has no basis in history, no basis in the Constitution or the legal documents. Yeah, and I think we're referring to what's happening with the, a, the ACC um, uh, Council, or presiding standing committee, um, which was one of the instruments of the communion, the, the, stand, the uh, um, ACC. And over time now, it's become ultra-liberal, and all the conservatives have left. Uh, Rambi used to be part of it. Um, it's a joke. Yeah, it's I, a, it really I, I'd hate to be so harsh, but it has no credibility among the uh, poor, among great swaths of the global south. Mm -hmm. It, um, frankly, it does its business in a dishonest way. Well, sure. And I and I and that is my strong opinion. It is dishonest. Well, it's dishonest because when you write to them and say, "How did this happen?" they won't respond to you. Well. For example, they, yeah. they have a new constitution they adopted uh, last year, and each of the provinces are supposed to approve this change. Mm -hmm. Well, I contacted several provinces, and in one example, Gregory Venables, the primate of the Southern Cone, said, we were never asked. Mm -hmm. And he, said, he told me he checked all his emails, all his communications. Mm -hmm. They were never asked. They never approved the change. Mm -hmm. uh, the same with Uganda. Mm -hmm. Couldn't and the and when I talked to the Church of England, oh yes, we were asked and our Archbishop's Council approved the change. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the uh, ACC and said, okay, who, who approved this? When did they approve this? And how did they approve it? And I was told it was none of my business. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. Here's an organization that's supposed to be a church organization. They run roughshod over their own rules. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, ch the, there's a phrase, uh, a nation of rules versus a nation of a nation of laws versus a nation of men. Right. Meaning the law applies to everybody. It's not just according to the whim of individuals. Mm -hmm. The structures of our church, the Anglican Communion, had been based upon a structure of laws. No more. No. It's, it's a structure of men and power and naked, pure power politics. Sure. And that's really become more and more evident as we go on to watch those, struggle, those structures struggle to maintain power because their church is dying. You know, the Church of England... Let, let, let yeah. me just put it in starkest sure. possible terms. Mm -hmm. And it's not me... I'm repeating this. Okay. Archbishops of the Anglican Communion tell me that the Anglican Consultative Council Standing Committee is dishonest. Sure. They do not trust... That is their word, dishonest. Corrupt. This is what people, archbishops, leaders of the vast majority of the members, the people in the pews, are telling me sure. the structures are fraudulent. Yes, they are. And those yeah. are their words. I'm not, it's not hyperbole on my part. No. We've got Gregory Venables on tape <laughs> saying stuff like, you have Gregory Venables on tape saying we, stuff we like this. We can say we, you're a we. Uh, yeah, uh, for a fair disclosure, George Conger's on the Anglican TV Board of Directors, but you're also a great personality on camera. Oh. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the deep pockets, the, the money pocket. man. Yeah. You are the money. Yeah, right. Okay, the money <laughs> man. So that's that's kind of the the, the Catherine Jeffrey Shorey news is her, her uh, trying to change um, from presiding bishop to archbishop, and maybe in the future we'll see papal authority given to her. I don't know what's in her mind. I don't know what's yeah. in her heart. She yeah. may not be consciously attempting to do this, mm -hmm. but what is happening? The, sure. the facts are, this is where things are moving. What we see in the ground. Now, what's the big deal with uh, Title IV then? Well, the big deal is that puts uh, the, the remaining conservative bishops in tech, which would be Bishop Mark Lawrence and Bishop uh, Love of, Mark Lawrence of South Carolina and Love of Albany in danger uh, of... Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you a, a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. My diocese in Central Florida in the mm -hmm. Episcopal Church will be electing a new bishop. Right. People are saying, oh, well, we need to elect somebody who's very young so they can get in so we can make sure we have a conservative bishop because we're not going to be able to uh, have that in 10 years. Under Title IV, a bishop of any age can be removed for yes. any reason. 
Yeah. In other words, they don't, you know, the, pro the, project the, the protections of the past are gone with Title IV. Sure. Now, its supporters say there are, there are parts of Title IV that are reformed and are more open and, not, and whatnot. So it's, I'm not saying the entire thing is bad. But there are elements to it that just upend the whole American polity, their wonderful word, polity of the Episcopal Church in favor for a centralized autocracy, a dictatorship. Yeah. I was talking to a person in the standing committee in the Diocese of Albany, and that's exactly why they, you know, one of the reasons they elected uh, Bishop Love is his age. Mm -hmm. is, you know, he'll, he'll be in there a good long time. And uh, if he steps out of line, no, he won't. No, now with Title IV, that, that she's got a new tool that will say age has nothing to do with it anymore. So. And, and the funny thing is, once, this, once people wake up to this fact, mm -hmm. it will probably see more fiery radical candidates being put forward for bishop sure. simply because they're, you know, they're used to, you play it safe and you become a bishop. Sure. And once you're in, then you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Not anymore. Not anymore at all. Um, quick news from Church of England. Um, they're dealing with um, some secular issues. The uh, new law is uh, you can't discriminate against our sexual orientation. And so they're saying, well, we have to put bishops in, replace bishops because bishops retire. Mm -hmm. And so, well, you, you can't uh, dissuade against whether or not uh, they're a gay bishop. I'll be a little bit contrary on this. Okay, please. I don't think there's anything new here. And that the legal opinion, they it's like saying you can, uh, we'll allow gay bishops, but they can't be gay. Right. Uh, meaning, in other words, there's a confusion. Uh, Bishops who are unmarried must be celibate, mm -hmm. chaste, not engage in sexual activity right. of any sort with male or female. Right. And if you want to call yourself a gay bishop but be perfectly celibate, that's fine. There have been throughout history men who are not called to marriage mm -hmm. and who may have attractions to other men but who through various prayer or what have you mm -hmm. are not acting upon that, right. who have been remain, bishops. And remain celibate. And remain celibate. So there's no, I think the joke is, uh, the Church of England will authorize women bishops so long as they're men. That's right. um, you know, you can. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so. But, the, but you are exactly right in saying that the secular pressure mm -hmm. upon the D Church of England from the wider from the English government, from the chattering classes, mm -hmm. is tremendous. Mm -hmm. And so they've got in one way to sort of cover, their, cover themselves by saying, we will not discriminate against gay bishops, but we won't appoint gay bishops because they're gay. All right. So it, it's a double talk. All right, on to new controversies. Now, if I were telling you that, you know, in the Anglican communion, it's still possible to be an archbishop and be under threat of arrest. Uh, you know, no, this is the 21st century. Mm -hmm. You know, you wear a collar, you walk around the world, and uh, there's some th authority and presence and respect for that. That's still not true in third world countries. Right. Um, I mean, you know, and I'm referring to Tanzania, if you want to give well, us a quick story there. Yeah, I mean, you remember Idi Amin shot a bishop, yes. archbishop. Um, uh, an arrest warrant has been issued for the archbishop of Tanzania, mm -hmm. Valentino Mokiwa. Right. And the story there is archbishop... Uh, a new bishop was elected for the Diocese of Mount Kilimanjaro, mm -hmm. Stanley Hote. The old bishop, Simon McCourty, uh, had, had retired. Uh, bishop Simon's man lost the election. Uh, Arch uh, bishop Hote was elected, and supporters of the man who lost filed a lawsuit in civil court saying, Stanley's not reached his 40th birthday, therefore he's not eligible to be bishop. Boy, tech has influence everywhere, but go on. Well, okay. <laughs> now, here's the fun. The loser of the uh, Bishop McCurdy and the judge are members of the Go-Go tribe. Okay. At, and I'm not making that no, up. No, no. Okay. You got the beat. Go on. Uh, there's this tribal politics involved here. Mm. And uh, the judge issued an injunction saying, you cannot or consecrate this man, Bishop of Mount Kilimanjaro, until I hear all the facts of the case. Mm -hmm. Archbishop Mokiwa went ahead and consecrated him, but technicality he didn't con he did not install him as dot bishop of Mount Kilimanjaro. Right. In other words, he divided the office of bishop from the particular jurisdiction. Right. 
Well, the day after the consecration, which, by the way, was attended by the local police general, sure. Bishop of Leicester, England, uh, it was not hidden on, no. in any way. No. A, the judge, uh, Bishop uh, Justice Sambo, uh, Judge Sambo, issued an arrest warrant for a contempt of court. And Bishop, Archbishop Mokiwa went from Arusha, where the warrant was issued, to Dar es Salaam uh, to avoid being served with arrest. Sure. Well, what's all behind this is tribal jealousies, political jealousies, my man lost, we're unhappy. But the p same people who are pushing hard against Archbishop Mokiwa are the ones in Tanzania who are taking money from the U.S. and Canada. Oh, absolutely. And supporters of the Archbishop in Tanzania tell me that there's a push on to prevent Archbishop Mokiwa's re-election mm -hmm. as Archbishop. They're elected to a fixed year term and then are re-elected. His term is coming up. And there's a group of bishops. Two thousand, let me just backtrack, I'm sorry. 2006, the Tanzanian bishops said they will take no money from the Episcopal Church. Correct. Some of the bishops said, no, we're going to take money anyway. That's right. And they're still taking money. And in fact, they held a conference earlier this year, part of the uh, continuing Indaba project, mm -hmm. took all this money from the U.S. and Canada, and neglected to tell Archbishop Mokiwa they were going to have a meeting in his diocese yeah. until like the day before. It was, under, it was completely held under his nose without his knowledge, uh, and he was notified, oh, by the way, if you're in town, yeah. So the bishops who are or members of the Goko tribe are the ones taking money mm -hmm. from 815 in sure. Canada and are behind the lawsuit, the, peop the sources in Tanzania say. Yeah, which, you know, you look at it and say, it, you've got to be kidding. I said, no, I mean, it, it really serves 815 to have influence in all these countries and to maintain it and for very little money, I mean, we're not talking uh, a lot of money. $50,000. $50,000. You can have a great influence in places like Tanzania. They've tried the same in Uganda with a, uh, a bishop who was, you know, not in agreement with uh, Arabi and stuff like that. They've, they have the ability uh, with financial uh, promises to gain su support from, let's say, unfaithful bishops. Well, just like the Archbishop of Central Africa, Mm -hmm. uh, brand new man, he had to release a statement last month mm -hmm. saying, I, unlike my other brother Africans, have not broken completely with the Episcopal Church. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean we're changing our mind. Right. We'll take their money, but we won't agree with them. Now, that's a point of view. It's not held by the Ugandans, for instance. Henry right. Arambi thinks that with money comes obligations. <laughs> And the Afri Central Africans are saying, we'll take the money, but we won't honor the obligations. Right. It's a tricky road. I mean, when you're in a country where people are starving to death and money yeah. is offered to you, what do you do? And that is, you know, the trouble with the Congo, Sudan, um, and other places is money means life. Mm -hmm. It's not here where money means a new building. Mm -hmm. uh, in these countries, uh, you know, $30 a month is saving a person's life through mosquito nets, through food, through uh, health care, through all these different environments. Clean water. Yeah. And there's some worthwhile projects being done supported by liberal parishes in the United States who are doing good work on the ground for people. Yeah. But you, it gets into the political ramifications because some of these people want a quid pro quo. Right. We There's saw this strings attach. In after the 1998 Lambeth Conference, the Bishop of Washington, D.C., Bishop Haynes, was furious and livid and said, I'm going to cut off money to the Africans, Ugandans, for what, how they voted. Mm -hmm. I mean, he said this publicly to the, I was there, I heard it. Sure. And that is the environment in which we're living where some people are doing good with no expectations of return. Others are giving you money with the expectation you're going to walk and vote and do what I say. That's right. And that has hurt us in the past. There mm -hmm. are faithful archbishops who stand up and say, I won't take the money if there's strings attached. Mm -hmm. And um, that has really affected the, the polity over the last 15, 20 years. Now we're in the point where archbishops are retiring. Mm -hmm. um, Venables is no longer Archbishop of the Southern Cone. Mm -hmm. 
um, a Rambi will probably retire in the next three years. We don't know when, but he'll, he'll hit the date when he'll he must hit, retire. He'll hit the date when he must retire. Um, a coffee of West Africa. A coffee. Um, you, you can go through a list of six arch, or seven archbishops mm -hmm. who are conservative or orthodox that are you know, coming up on a... Peter Jensen of Sydney, Australia. Right, are coming up on a time in the next three to five years where they're stepping down and going to be replaced. And what, what people should know is that you're going to, I believe you're going to see in Nigeria, Peter Akinola was regarded in, by the left in England and in America as, sure. oh, the devil incarnate, he couldn't get any worse. Archbishop Oko is, is much worse, <laughs> much stronger. I know. In other words, we're, you're not going to see a softening no. of positions. Yeah. You're going to see what happened in Nigeria, a strengthening yeah. of positions. Uh, Oka is, uh, you know, basically uh, Akinola on steroids. Yeah, he's yeah, he's, a, he's a former surprise. army chap, an yeah. army officer. He, yeah. Yeah. He's, not as, he's not as pastoral as Archbishop Akinola. <laughs> And for some people, they'll fall out of their chair because they'll think, Archbishop Akinola was pastoral, I never knew. <laughs> and so we're going to watch another amazing time in the Anglican Communion. Now, uh, we've watched primate meeting after primate meeting. Now we've gone to the Orthodox are no longer attending primate meetings. Mm -hmm. we, uh, what, and, and they're no longer attending Lambeth. Um, they're no longer attending to the structures of the old British colonial church. Mm -hmm. Something new is emerging, and we've seen part of that in GAFCON. There's another GAFCON coming up. It's going to be interesting and something to pray about as to what is Anglican communion transitioning into for structure. The, and their conflicting visions. What we're seeing in the, at the GAFCON movement is a denomination, is a confessional church arising, people who believe the same things. Mm -hmm. Now that confession is widely, is fairly wide so that you can have Anglo-Catholics and Evangelicals believing the same things sure. on one level, even though they may disagree on the real presence and some, these yeah. others, which are important issues, which yes. I'm not downplaying, no. but they are second order issues. They understand they're not salvation issues. Yes. So that there's a, so that the Anglican communion is, is evolving into a confessional uh, organization on one level. Mm -hmm. In other levels in the United States, the Episcopal Church, it's also becoming a confessional church because the conservatives are being pushed out, driven out, or they're just biding their time waiting to collect their, Pensions. put in their, the clergy are put, waiting to put in their 30 years and then out they go. Mm -hmm. So the Episcopal Church has become more monochrome in its beliefs. Even though the the statistics put out by the Episcopal Church so that the people in the pews are evenly divided between left and right. Mm -hmm. The leadership is overwhelmingly left-wing. But I'm, I'm getting off from your point, but the future that we're seeing is a confessional future of a future saying this is what we believe and a strengthening of uh, international bonds. Here at this, uh, here at this GAFCON, uh, this meeting of the ACNA, uh, it's an American Canadian church. There are people who were born in New Zealand, mm -hmm. uh, Julian Dobbs, uh, Nigeria, yeah. Felix Oji. Um, I know there are other uh, people not from the United States who are bishops working in the United States. It's becoming internationalized. It really is. And some people have even wanted to drop the bomb of having a conciliar church where we have one big meeting in the church. I thought you said Obama, and that really would have been a bomb. <laughs> that would have been a bomb. <laughs> the Obama church. I... <laughs> okay, I, I... He, he's bombing elsewhere. Okay, okay. but to, uh, to have a conciliar meeting um, and hash out all these problems once and for all. Henry Arambi told you on tape, mm -hmm. and me, I sat in the background, made faces okay. during the filming. Henry Arambi told you that what he wants to see is a council called akin to the Vatican right. II Council. Yeah. Not a Lambeth 2008 was a total waste of time. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was an expensive graduate school bull session. It was. It's horrible. It, um, I was at 98, I was at 2008, and I know the difference between substance and fluff. Mm -hmm. What Henry Arambi has called for and others have called for is a session and that it takes as long as it takes 
Vatican II type thing or the Council of Nicaea. We're not talking about two weeks no. in Canterbury. We're talking months, or whatever it takes to work and flesh out what we believe. And where we as leaders in the church give our opinion. Uh, I, we have a perfect example at the primates meeting in Egypt where we had the press conference with Roland Williams at the end and I asked his opinion on uh, the defrocking of Bishop uh, uh, Duncan and uh, J.R. Packard. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, as our spinship, I don't think I can give my opinion on that. You know, and something that, you know, it, it's got to be killing him on the inside that this is happening to the church and he won't speak to it. In these type of councils, we need to be open with our leadership and speak to all the issues that are going on and be forthcoming. And uh, that's something that we don't, we, we see in the Orthodox, and we see avoidance of the strong issues in the liberal uh, areas or a, a point where we're just gonna keep talking about it and have a listening process. Yes, and that the, um, there's a sense that uh, if, if we keep talking about it, you will change your mind. That's right. Rather than we coming to a common knowledge or coming to an understanding of the other person's opinion, mm -hmm. it's we're going to hold on and see who goes under first. Nobody's ever come to Christ by losing an argument. And it's, it's a fair statement. It's a fair statement. Um, now, obviously, this uh, Anglican report has gone longer than others, but we've not sat down since General Convention uh, 2009, was mm -hmm. it? 2009. Yeah. Um, so we went in a little extra long, but these are important issues, and these are the, kind of the four issues that are really at the forefront of what's going on today in the uh, Anglican Communion. Um, Can I, I just, just... Go ahead. Go yeah. Things... I'm actually optimistic mm -hmm. for the first time in years. Sure because of what I see happening in the ACNA and in the Global South, in certain dioceses and places in the Episcopal Church and the Church of England, good things are happening as well as all the junk. Sure, well, all the little innuendos and messes are so outshadowed by the brightness of the good that's happening, which is the way God has always done it. Mm -hmm. You know, God has used sinners to make a kingdom. People are coming to a saving faith in Jesus Christ right. through the Anglican way, yeah. here and in Africa, and in India, and in Asia, and in Australia. Yeah, to, you, nobody has to look any further than the gene, genealogy of Jesus mm -hmm. to find out what a mess. And, and, and I know architecture will turn off a lot of people, <laughs> oh, yes. uh, California tacky. Um, <laughs> 70s redone. Yeah, but, but, you know, it, it's amazing what God will do with people who will uh, get on their knees and say, I, I, I'm here for you. And so we want to finish up this Anglican Report and thank you for watching. I'm sure some of you tuned out 10 minutes ago, some 20 minutes ago. Not my mother, she's watching. Yeah, and Mom, thank you for watching the whole 40 minutes. God bless and we'll catch you at the next Anglican Report. I'm George Conker. And I'm Kevin Coulson. <laughs>